Um, so real quick, um, I think everyone, in the if you're enrolled in the class, you should have gotten an email saying that you now have an, an account on something called Narwhal. Did everyone get that email from the PDL or no? You're always, okay, no one got this, okay. Um, so I, I put your guys' name in to get an account for the cluster we're gonna have available to you guys to, to, to test and debug and, and do performance testing with your, your project number two. Um, so I, I sent the roster, everyone's Andrew's ID, I'll check to see what's, what's going on. Um, you should get an email saying you have an account and then there'll be, I'll send a post out on Piazza to say, here's where you, here's where we actually go to log in and use those, uh, and use those machines, okay? All right, uh, so for today's agenda, we're gonna do, uh, we're gonna talk about another latch free index. Right, so remember Tuesday we talked about the latch free skip list, latch, latch free concurrent skip list. So for today, we're gonna talk about the BW tree from Microsoft. Uh, and then we're gonna talk about the, the art index from the hyper guys, which is not actually latch free, uh, but it has other interesting properties that I think are worth, worth looking at. And then we'll finish up doing, uh, sort of do a quick crash course on how to do profiling in Peloton. Um, and this using, this, again, you'll need this for project two to figure out uh, you know, why your index could possibly be running slow, okay? So, uh, so an observation we make from last class was that we talked about, when we, were, when, when we talked about the, the concurrent skip list, we said that we couldn't have reverse pointers or backwards pointers along the uh, lowest level in the index because we wouldn't able be, we're not able to do uh, atomic updates to, to insert or delete nodes uh, using compare and swap because we'd be have, have, we have to touch two memory addresses, right? So remember, compare and swap is like you give it one memory location and you can, you can flip the bits if it matches what you expect to, expect to be there. But if you had to add um, reverse pointers, now you have to update two locations, right? The pointers for two different nodes and you can't do that atomically with compare and swap. The only way you could do that and guarantee that it would be atomic would be to take a latch. Right, which would defeat the purpose of a latch free, latch free index. So the BW tree that we're gonna look at now solves this problem by doing it a different way, uh, or storing your, your pointers in a different way. So the BW tree is a latch free uh, B plus tree like index where the threads are never gonna have to set any latches or block on each other in order to do any modifications, do lookups, reads, inserts, updates, or deletes. Um, and so the, the history of the BW tree was, uh, this was developed by Microsoft uh, in the early 2010s. Uh, and this was built for the, the Hecaton uh, project, or the Hecaton engine, which we talked about before a little bit about how this was sort of a specialized engine for ODP workloads that Microsoft built inside of SQL Server. So you sort of like, instead of just throwing away SQL Server entirely, you had this little thing called Hecaton, this, this separate engine that was an in-memory OLTP you know, uh, optimized system that could uh, live nicely inside of the entire SQL Server ecosystem. So the outside still looked like regular SQL Server, but internally it was using the Hecaton engine. And how the, actually the, the project got started is relevant to a discussion we had on, on, on with the skip list last week, was when they started the Hecaton project in 2008, they originally decided that they were gonna go ahead with skip list, and that was gonna be the primary index for, for Hecaton. Right, cause again, it was a latch free index that had sort of nice properties that were relevant to what Microsoft was trying to do with Hecaton. But then around ha halfway through the project, they realized that the skip list didn't have the properties or didn't get the, the kind of scalability that, that they would want. Uh, so they ended up abandoning the skip list and went ahead and built the BW tree. Now what's interesting about this, as I said last class, the only database system, as far as I know, that uses skip list as the primary index is MemSQL. And so the reason why the MemSQL people use skip list is because one of the co-founders was at Microsoft at the, at the time when they were building Hecaton. And he saw all these sort of internal Hecaton talks where they're saying, oh, look how great skip lists were. So then when he went off down to San Francisco and, and formed his company, uh, they were all in with skip list, right? Because it sort of has, you know, it has nice properties. But he missed the sort of second half of the talks from the Microsoft guys where they came back and said, well, skip list are actually, is not what you want to do and you want to use the, the BW tree. So that's sort of part of the reason why, why MemSQL is like big on skip list. So there's two key properties or two key ideas in our BW tree that is that allow us gonna be latch free and avoid that uh, you know, reverse pointer problem that we saw in the skip list. The first idea is that we're, we're 
only going to record changes to the index in the context of these delta records. So that means that you're never going to update a, a node or page in the index in place. You're never going to go take an existing page in memory and overwrite it to shuffle it to add a new key or delete a key. Instead, you're going to append these delta records to it to say, here's the change that, that, that occurred. Sort of again, think of this sort of like a, like a log structured organization. And the, the advantage we're going to get from this is that it's going to reduce caching invalidation because every single time there's a change to a node or page in the index, we're just appending one delta record. We're not reshuffling or, or moving everything around inside of the, the page node or the, the leaf node. The other key thing is that we're going to have a, a, a mapping table that's going to provide us an indirect, a way to do, have indirection between logical pointers inside the index and physical pointers in memory. And then because we're going to have this mapping table, uh, we're going to have this indirection information stored in this mapping table, we can do compare and swap inside of the mapping table that will update all the pointers throughout the entire index without having to update them uh, one by one or set a latch for them. So we can update one location in the mapping table and that will get propagated to every, every node inside the index that may be using that pointer. So I'll, I'll go through each of these one by one, but this, the mapping, idea, mapping table is a key, key idea. So for this, uh, let's do a really simple example of a, a three node, two level uh, BW tree. Um, so the first thing I'll point out is here's this auxiliary data structure, the mapping table on the side, where that's going to be a mapping from the page IDs to physical addresses. So every index page, and I'll use page and node interchangeably, but it's the same thing. Every index page will be assigned a unique identifier. And then in the mapping table, we'll have physical pointers to where they exist in memory. And so in this case here, in this diagram, I'm showing in, in the solid lines, that'll be a, a physical pointer to a physical memory location. And then the red dotted lines will be a logical pointer. So in addition to each page, in addition to having the, a page ID and then the physical pointer to tell us where to go, we're also going to have internally logical pointers that are just the page IDs for the children of a, of a parent node and then your siblings. So in this case here, for this parent page 101, it's saying that it's two children of 102 and 104. So that means that in order for me to traverse this index and find my child, I do my lookup in the mapping table and that's going to give me the physical address of where I need to go. Right? And this is different than the skip list we saw last time because the skip list was actually embedding the physical pointers directly inside each, each, each node or page in the index. Where in here, we just store this unique number and then we know how to go look it up to find the thing that we're looking for. All right, this, so this, is this clear? This is sort of the key idea of, of the mapping table. So let's see now how the delta records work. So for this, we'll keep it super simple. Say we just have a single page in our index, uh, page 102, and of course we have in our mapping table, we have a, a mapping to the physical address where it's located. So when a thread comes along and wants to modify a key, uh, that, or key range that's, that's maintained by this page, right, whether it's an insert, update, or delete, it doesn't matter. Instead of actually going modifying the page itself, it's going to append a delta record. And the delta record is going to specify what the operation was that the thread did that modified this page. So in this case here, I want to insert key 50, or, you know, with a key value pair with a key 50. So I would have a delta record that this is an insert and the changes to key 50. So now in the, in the delta record, it's going to have a physical pointer to its, its parent base page. Not a logical pointer, but a physical pointer. Right? And the reason why it's a physical pointer is because we're going to maintain the delta chain for a single base page. We're going to treat that as sort of a single atomic unit. Right? So at no point is this thing going to get moved around independently of its delta records. Like, this page owns these delta records, so it, it knows that this pointer is always going to be valid. So now what we're going to need to do is at this point, we've inserted the delta record at the front of the, the, the chain for this base page, but no other thread can see it, right? Because anytime someone says, I want to look up page, I want to look up page 102, it's going to look in the mapping table and then land here, right? It doesn't know about this. So now what we're going to do is we're going to do a compare and swap to, on the mapping table to install the delta address uh, as the new physical location of page 102. So in this case here, again, we just do the compare and swap. If we succeed, then now this mapping table points to the delta record. So now this, this chain becomes visible to any other thread. If anybody comes along and, and wants to look up page 102, they're going to land in our delta record first. 
and then they know how to apply that change and, and it's a turtle map. We'll see how we do a, a search next slide. Same thing if I have another uh, if I have another modification made to this 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 page, say I want to delete key 48, then same thing. I would first set it up so that this thing points to the new physical address of the the the, the previous delta record, and then I do a compare and swap to now this thing becomes the, the head of the, the, the delta chain. So this is clear what's going on here. Right? It's 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 pretty straightforward. So now, let's talk about how to do a search. Say I want to do a lookup on uh, some key that's within, you know, that's maintained by this page here. Right? So we're going to traverse the tree just as we would in a, in a B plus tree, uh, meaning we would look at each node, we would look at the markers to say whether I need to go left or right, and then when we hit the leaf nodes, we know that we're, we, the, we're not pointing to another node, we're pointing to the actual tuples that, uh, that we want. So in this case here, what will happen is when I want to do a lookup, and uh, as I traverse the tree, and I say, oh, well, I now I, need, I know I need to go look at page 102, uh, I would do the lookup at the mapping table, and I would land at the, the head of the version chain. So now what's going to happen is, as I scan down the version chain, um, the thread's going to maintain this sort of internal memory model about all the delta records that it's seeing. And then if it knows that if it's looking for a particular key, where it sees a delta record that corresponds to it, it can stop right there, it doesn't have to keep going. So if I say I was looking for uh, key 50, I would land here in the, in, in the top. Uh, this is dealing with key 48, so that has nothing to do with me, so I skip that. Then I get here, and it's key 50, that's the thing I'm looking for, so I know my entry exists, and I don't need to keep going down in the chain. Right? If the key that I'm looking for is not in the version chain, then I land in the base node, and I just do the, the binary search you would normally do in a regular B plus tree. Right? And the key thing about this is that this, is being in, this, is, this version chain is going backwards in time. So the latest version, or the latest delta record is always going to be at the head. So that means is that if I have, say, right here, delete key 50, uh, I'm not going to see that because I'll find my insert here, and that occurred logically uh, after that delete, so therefore it should be there. Right? Right, so same thing, when, and when you reach the bottom, you just do the binary search as, as you normally would. So let's see now what happens if, if we have two threads trying to update the same page at the same time. Right? Say that uh, this, there's two threads, the first guy wants to delete 48, the first guy wants to insert 16, and it's going to be again the same thing that we saw in the skip list. Right? They'll both try to do a compare and swap on this entry here uh, to change the pointer to now point to either one of them. They're both going to have the same physical pointer because that's, that's, that's the way this, it just works. But when they try to do the compare and swap, say this guy, the first guy wins, right? So it, now it knows that its delta record has been su successfully installed in the chain. This thread would recognize that it, the compare and swap failed, so it had to come back and retry to, uh, to do the change again, so which, which, in which case it would put its insert on top of this thing because this is now the head of the version chain. So we'll see this in a second when we talk about doing structure modifications. But uh, if you're doing an insert, update, or delete, it's just like in the skip list where if the compare and swap fails, it's up to you inside the index to go back and try it again. When we talk about structure modifications, you're actually going to want, want to abort the operation you're trying to do uh, and don't keep trying it. And this is slightly different than the skip list, and, and we'll see why in a second. But again, if it's insert, update, delete, if the compare and swap fails, the index wrapper would come back and try to ins do the same operation over again. And at which point it would just be, you know, being, a, being appended on top of this. So the, there's basically two types of delta records we're going to have. So the ones I've shown so far are the, the sort of standard insert, update, deletes. And right, this is pretty straightforward to understand. But then we'll see in a, in a second how you can do uh, special de delta records to deal with structure modifications. Again, this is a B plus tree-like index. So we have to be able to do the, uh, the split and merges that you would normally do in, in a regular B plus tree. So in the, uh, in the paper, they talk about how uh, the, 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 the default size for the version chain or how long you, you want to try to keep it is like eight records. Um, when we, in our own version of the BW tree, we've done similar experiments. We see that eight records is, is, is about the right number. It gives you the right trade-off between how expensive it is going to be to traverse, in, traverse the chain versus how often you're going to have to do consolidation and garbage collection. All right, so again, so, so co consolidation is when the version chain is going to get too long, and 
we want to collapse all these delta records and apply it to our, to our base page. Remember I said before though, we don't want to do any of our updates in place. So in order to do consolidation, what we're going to do is we're going to first make a copy of the base page, right, down here. And then we're going to go in, um, in reverse order up the chain and apply, the, apply each delta record to this new page table one by, or in this new page one by one. And then once we've applied all the changes, now we know that the state of this page is equivalent to what you would see if you were traversing the, the, the full chain that's from the original page. So then, just like before, now we need to have the other threads know about our, our new consolidated page. So we'll do a compare and swap in the mapping table to now have it point to, to this thing here. And again, the logic is the same. If it's the compare and swap fails, you know that somebody else inserted a, either a delta record above this and we missed it, or they also did a consolidation. Right? Again, the way it's described in the paper, once the delta chain reaches a certain size, then all threads, will, that'll trigger a, a consolidation by all threads. So one of them is always going to succeed and all the other ones are going to fail. And remember, this, this is what I was saying before, if your consolidation fails, rather than keep trying to redo it, you just abort that and go and abort that operation and go back and do what you were trying to do before. So you would do this consolidation, say if you're doing a lookup on key 50, you would come along and recognize that the delta chain has gotten too long and then that would trigger the consolidation. If it, if it succeeds, you're done and you know you're, you know, you, you can sort of piggyback off of that and get, get the key you were looking for. If it fails, then you just come back and do the search again. Right? And the search has to be a complete traversal of the tree to get to this page. Yes? So what are the contents of the page? There's just the key so her question is, what's the contents of the page? So it's the, it's the, the B plus tree thing that I shared last time, right? You have an array of keys, an array of values, right? It's just yeah, so if you're doing so many inserts, it may spill over from the, I mean, there may be no space in your page to insert a new key, right? So her statement is, if, it's, uh, if you're doing a lot of inserts into this page, at some point it's going to get too big and you have to spill it over. And yes, you have, to, you have to do a split, just like a regular B plus tree. And I'll, I'll show that in a second. Any other questions? Again, the difference between the skip list is that the way we're going to do uh, avoid latches is to have this mapping table because it's in direction. So we can just change one memory address and don't have to worry about fussing with the internal, uh, the internal pointers inside, inside of the, uh, the, the data structure itself. All right, so now, at this point, we've done the compare and swap, and now our new page is the the, you know, the current you know, page for, 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 for page ID 102. So at this point, we want to mark this, this, this old page and all its deltas as being available for garbage collection. Right? But then we're going to have that same problem that we had before uh, in, in the skip list where some thread might be hanging out inside of our, uh, our delta chain and we don't want to free up the memory right away because if they then try to follow this pointer to get to the old page 102, it would you know, go to an invalid address and read garbage and fail. So we need to be careful, just like before in the skip list, to make sure that we only collect uh, garbage when, we're, you know, when we know, know the threat is, is, could be touching the data we're, we're messing with. So in the BW tree, they do the same epoch-based garbage collection that I talked about last time. Right? So basically, there's going to be some global counter for the epoch that's going to be uh, incremented every so often periodically by a separate thread. It could be 10 milliseconds, it could be 50 milliseconds. It doesn't necessarily ma doesn't matter too much. Um, and what will happen is any time a thread enters the index to perform an operation, we'll tag it to say that, you know, what, what is the current epoch for, for that operation. And so the threads will have to join the epoch when they enter the index, and then we have to know that they left uh, when they're, they're done doing what they want to do. And we're going to say again that the Garbage for an epoch can only be reclaimed once we know all the threads that were inside of our system for that epoch have successfully e exited. And it's not just your current epoch that you're dealing with, but it's also, also previous epochs. Right? If I go from epoch 1 and there's a thread inside of it and then I switch to epoch 2, but that first thread is still in epoch 1, I can't free anything in epoch 2 until I know that 1 is, is safe. Right? So let's look at an example here. So this is the same setup we had before. Right? We uh, we have our delta chain off of 102. Uh, we do a consolidation, and we're going to make a new page too. So at this point, when we start off, 
uh, there's a th there's a thread running on CPU one that's at this point in 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 the uh, in in the the version chain. So we had in our epoch table, right? Sort of sort of metadata for our, what's going on in our current epoch. We would keep track of this, this thread is actually you know is alive in us. Uh, and then we're going to have another thread. Sorry, another thread running on CPU two, and it's going to do it's be do, it's going to be doing the consolidation. So we again we collapse all the delta records into our new page one two. We do the compare and swap to now that this is now the, the new version uh, of page 102. Um, and then the CPU would recognize, well, this base node and all its delta records, I've just replaced it by putting everything in this guy. So this entire thing can be garbage collected. So what it'll maintain uh, in, inside of the, the epoch table, the metadata for the epoch, that, th these, are the, that these nodes and this, 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 page no uh, this base page and its delta chain can be deleted. So then CPU2 finishes up, it does what, what, you know, finishes whatever it is it wanted to do, and then it leaves the epoch. Now at this point, again, we don't want to free up this memory because we know that CPU1 is still hanging around, the thread running on CPU1 is still hanging around somewhere in, this, in, in our delta chain. So only when it finishes and it leaves the epoch is it safe to actually then go ahead and garbage collect it. So I didn't really talk about this last time, but um, it was sort of implied that in order to do epoch-based garbage collection, uh, there has to be some auxiliary data structures or extra bookkeeping you have to do to know what threads are hanging around and what the data, what data is there. And then whether you have a separate thread comes along and does all this garbage collection for you or it's cooperative, it doesn't necessarily matter. The protocol still stays the same. Like for example, you could have something like every other thread that enters the, uh, the index could look in the epoch table or the bookkeeping information for the previous epochs and decide whether it's now safe to go delete older stuff. Or you could have, in the case we're going to provide for you in the project number two, there'll be a separate thread that periodically gets invokes that perform GC function and will go ahead and, and clean these things up for you. It doesn't necessarily matter, but this is, you know there's no other thread running in, that, in these previous epochs, and therefore it's safe to delete this. In the back. So, shouldn't, uh, so in this case, when you do the garbage production, you should, need, uh, you should know the epoch number that you can clean. Yeah, so, yeah so, I, so I'm not sure that. So his statement is, uh, in order to do this gar type of garbage collection, you need to know what the, e the epoch number is. Correct. I, I'm not showing that. Um, again, it could be, it's a global, could be, you can use a global counter that you'd have one thread do an atomic, atomic addition every so often to increment it. So then there'll be like these, these functions when you enter the, the index, you know what the, the epoch is. And you can tag that for that thread and any single time you do something where you then, you know, put information, put things that can be deleted in the garbage collection epoch table, you would tag it and say, well, when I, when I entered the system, I entered the index, I was at epoch 2, so therefore this data can be deleted once epoch 2 is considered safe. So this is not like the uh, responsibility for the index? So his statement is, this is not the responsibility of the index. Uh, now we're, we're parsing semantics, so what do you mean by that? What do you mean the responsibility of the index? Uh, so, so, like, this should be managed by the high-level like, concurrency mechanism. Ah, so his statement is, uh, this epoch information should be managed by the high-level concurrency control protocol of the database system. Why? Uh, because only them know the epoch. Uh, so his statement is, it's only the concurrency control scheme knows the epoch. Mm -hmm. So this is independent of the concurrency control protocol of the system. So I can do two-phase locking that doesn't have an epoch. I can do two-phase locking for my higher level transactions and still use epoch-based garbage collection for the internal indexes. They're completely orthogonal to each other. Yes, if you're doing like MVCC with timestamp ordering with epochs, you could maybe share that information down with the indexes, but it, in, in practice it's usually implemented in, independently. All right, another way to think about this too is like I could have like, you know, say I have like, I, I have like 10 indexes, uh, but only one of them is ever getting updated. I don't need to update the epoch if no one's ever actually going in those other nine indexes, right? Whereas if you're, if you, if you having some higher level power come in and say, all right, update your, update your epoch, update your epoch, you may be doing it unnecessarily. This is sort of why we provide you also too with that, that needs GC function in, in the index wrapper. Because we'll, we'll poke you and say, do you want us to garbage collect? And if you come back and say false, we'll leave the index alone. Right? So again, the index will know what, it's, it's the same argument about like, you know, the database system always knows better. 
the index always sort of knows better, right? Because it knows what happened inside of it. So you can poke DHGC if you know that another thread has come along and your epoch table is empty, then you don't need garbage collection. And you don't, you don't waste cycles. Any other questions? That's a good point. Okay. So we actually, I mean, we have considered how to maybe combine the high level epoch management for the version control system and the indexes. Uh, but we haven't really thought through and, and done anything yet with it. Um, but it's, it's an interesting research topic. All right, so now we got to talk about structure modifications. So as I said before, uh, it's, it's a B plus tree at, and it's hard. So we're, we need to be able to do splits and merges. So I'm just going to show an example how to do a split. The merge is essentially the same thing, but just in reverse. So now we're going to have two special delta records that are not going to be exactly for, they're not going to be used to store you know, operations to modify the contents of the index, but rather these are going to be uh, delta records that correspond to uh, physical changes to the composition of the organization of the index. So we're going to have a split delta record that's going to allow us to specify that a subset of a key range for a particular base page is now being managed or now being, is now located at another base page in the index. And then we're going to have uh, the, the delta record will have a physical pointer to the previous delta record in the chain as well as a logical pointer to this new base page. And then we're also going to have a, a, a separated delta record that will use the higher level parts of, of the tree that'll say, uh, that act, basically acts as a shortcut to say if you're looking for this key range that I knew that I, knew I split down below, here's a fast track way to get to it without having to go all the way down to, to the version chains down below. So again, I'll, I'll show an example to make this more clear. So uh, this is not an easy thing to, 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 to walk through. And I, when, I, when I start showing the different steps of this, you're going to see a lot of different arrows. So I did the best I could to clean this up and make it like, easy to follow. But is, there is a lot going on here because it's kind of complicated. So, but I'll, I'll walk through uh, slowly one by one. So this is sort of our, our current state of our index when we start off. Right? We have two levels. And we're going to have uh, uh, three, three ba base pages at the bottom on the leaf nodes. And then for simplicity, I'm only going to show the, uh, the logical pointers going from sibling uh, from this direction. I'm not going to show the reverse pointers. Uh, it's basically, the, the protocol is exactly, exactly the same. For simplicity, I'm only, sh I'm only showing this way. All right, so uh, our keys that we're going to have stored in our index along the, uh, the, the leaf nodes will be like this. So page 102 will have key 1, 2. 103 will have 3, 4, 5, 6. And then 104 will have 7 and 8. So what we're going to want to do, we're going to we want to split page 103 to put half of its uh, key range in, or sort of take the upper half of its key range and store it in a new page, right? So to do this, the first thing we're going to do is just copy the, 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 the page that has the data that we want, but only include the keys that we want to include in our, in our split node. And then we're going to have a logical pointer from 105 to 104, because this is where it should appear if you scan along the, the leaves. Now at this point, nobody knows about page 105, right? Because if you do any lookup up above, you're still going to land on 103. Uh, if you scan along the leaf nodes, you're still going to go from 102, 103 to 104. So now what we need to do is uh, we're going to st stall an entry in, our, in our, our mapping table to point to 105. Again, still nobody knows about us. But now we're going to add the new split record that's going to tell uh, any thread that comes along that we have split the key range for page 103. So this delta chain, the split record is correspond to this chain for this page here. So it's basically going to say key 5 and 6 is no longer available for you at 103. It's going to be available for you at, at 105. And so the split record is going to have a physical pointer to the base page, because that's what we always have to have in the delta chain for a base page. But then it's going to have a logical pointer to, to 105. Now again, this is where the ordering sort of matters because before we can put the split record into our delta chain, we have to make sure that we have a physical address uh, to page ID 105 down here. Because when we add the logical address, if it's, this doesn't exist yet in the mapping table, someone could do a lookup and, and land nowhere. So we know that th this thing's been installed, so it's okay for us to add the logical pointer here. So now what we're going to need to do is, just as before, since uh, we're appending this to the head of the delta chain, we have to go back and update the, uh, the mapping for page 103 to now point to the, the split record. Again, this is a, no sorry, go ahead, yes. 
Yeah, so if the container swap operation fails, will the intermediate result be hit or abandoned? Right, so so for which for which one? Uh, so let's say the split the, 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 the last compare and swap operation failed. So th 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 like this one here, when I go when I update one or three to now point to the split record. Yeah. And your question is what? The will the five and six the, the, the new node will it be kept or abandoned? Okay, so his his qu question is, say I'm, I'm I'm at this point here. Uh, actually, we're, we're we're basically here. So we have a. No, we, we, we can be here. We have a physical pointer from the split record to base page 103. We have a logical pointer from the split record to base page 105. So his question is, if I now do the compare and swap on the mapping table for page 103, if, I can, if that fails when I try to make it point to the split record, what happens? Yeah. Well, what happens is that it, just, it fails. So what about the new node? Would it be deleted or just... Yeah, you have, you, so you'd, you'd want to... I mean, you could you could um, you could just try to do compare and swap again, or you could just say, "Well, my split failed. Let me just abandon it, right?" And at this point, like, although I'm putting the X's here, like, the data is still there because we don't ever modify the base page. And if anybody does a lookup for page one or three, they're still going to get here, right? So, say someone deletes key four, or sorry, someone deletes key five. Uh, they're not going to see the split record because when they do the lookup on base page one or three they're going to get this thing here. So then if I do my delete after the split fails and I come back and now I'll try to do the split again, I have to reason about whether that's the right thing to do anymore. Right? So typically I think the way we implement this is if, you, if your split fails, we just completely start over from scratch. Would that be a waste of time because you know, that's a So his statement is, is that, would that be considered a waste of time? Yes. But again, this, this whole idea of these latch-free data structures is you're, you're sort of optimistically assuming that, uh, that you're not going to have conflicts, and therefore it's better just to do these compare and swaps, which are much faster than taking heavyweight locks and, and pessimistically assume that n nothing's going to work out. Yes? Is there a, um, <laughs> like, like a percent, like, uh, like a, a cutoff threshold, uh, sorry. Uh, like a threshold. A th threshold, of, uh, you know, above which it's just not worth it. To do this optimistic flash free structure more yes. conflict is so, so common. Yeah, so his, so his statement is is there a threshold where there's just so much conflicts, so many conflicts that it's just not worth it doing this? Yes, this is actually something, uh, this is sort of a, an active area of research now is like, in the, in, if you just have super, super, super terrible contention, like everyone's trying to update this one thing, they all, all the different protocols basically degenerate to be exactly the same. Right? There's no magic you're gonna, you're, you can have to, to make it better. And the question is, like, at what point is there's so much contention where switching to a heavyweight locking scheme better? I, th there is a threshold, but it depends on a lot, you know, data structure, transactions, depends on a lot of different things. Yes, at some point, they all essentially, essentially being this, end up being the same thing. Um, in practice, though, like, this, is, this works out to be okay. Um, again, think about it. If, if everyone only ever wants to update uh, you know, key eight. Every you know, all thousand threads want to update it. There's no, nothing. You nothing to make this work. You know, great. You're basically running in serial order. All right. All right. So, uh, so we're at this point here. We're gonna do the compare and swap. And for for our purposes, we'll assume that it succeeds. And now, uh, page one of three points to the split record. So now, what happens is because we have these logical pointers, this is a great example of why they're useful. All we had to do is update this one physical address to this guy here. But the, 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 these pointers here and here were saying I point to logical page ID 103. So when I change this physical address, these things atomically also change as well without having to do anything. So now if I scan across the leaf nodes, instead of jumping from 102, 103 directly, I'll get up to the split page, the split record, and it'll say, well, now I need to know for to get the key range 3, 4, I'll go down here. And then to get key range 5 and 6, I have to go down to this guy here. And then I know how to come back up and get, get to 104. All right? So at this point, we, we could stop, right? This is still, this, at this point, the index is, is structurally sound and correct. And we're not going to have any false positive or false negatives, right? We're not going to lose any information or not see things that we should be seeing. Um, but it gets kind of expensive now because now you have to like uh, always traverse 
to this, to this split record and then know how to jump up and down between these different uh, leaf nodes to get to the key range that you're, you're actually looking for. I'll say also too is now at this point when this thing gets installed, if anybody wants to update 5 and 6, uh, they'll come down here and, and do their operation down here. The data is still technically stored here because we haven't consolidated yet. At some point we'll consolidate and then these things will get blown away and you know, this sort of will get all nicely you know, smoothed out. All right, so up above in our index, we still have the, uh, the markers about what key ranges are handled by different parts of the tree that still correspond to how the key range was laid out before we did our split. So we have this pointer here, it goes a negative infinity to 3, then we have 3 to 7, and we have 7 to infinity. But we now we know also too that there's a separate base node that will have uh, key range 5 to 6. But that's being encapsulated in, inside of 3 and 7, which would then take you down and see the split. So what you can do is you can add a new separator base node, uh, separator delta record above the, uh, the, the root node here that says now there is a new key range that's handled by another base node, ba base page node, for key range 5 and 7. So now if I want to do a lookup, say, on key 6, uh, I do my, again, my compare, actually, before I do that, compare and swap to now say that the root of the, of the tree is now the separator node. So now if I want to do, do a lookup on key 6, I would land here at the separator and say, oh, well, the thing I'm looking for is, is in between 5 and 7, so let me jump down to this logical pointer down here uh, and get to, the, get to the data I'm looking for. Uh, if not, then I'll jump down and go just as, as I was before. Right? And then in this case here, if I'm looking for key 4, I would come between 3 and 7, I get to the split, I would know that the key that I'm looking for is not handled by this new split, split node down here, so therefore I want to go back to the, to the original page uh, 103. Again, you don't need the separator to, uh, to ensure correctness. It just avoids having to do some extra jumps or traversal into the delta chain. It's sort of an, it's an optimization. Question, yes? Your question is, why does block 103... Uh, yeah, you're right, that, that is correct. Yeah, that should, be, that should be down there. Actually, no, hold up. No, no, see, so it, it, it's... You'd have, the split information is going to have to, you're going to have to know that if you want to now get to, if when you get to the end of this, you really should be going to, to, to this, not this. Right, that's stored in the split record. Because again, you're not allowed to modify a base page once it's created. Right, so that's what this logical pointer does for, do for you here. Right, it's, it's, again, it's extra bookkeeping inside the split record to allow you to, to do scans still correctly. In the back, yes. Um, is the X marking node 103 actually part of the node, uh, node 103 or part of the speed record? Your question is, are these X marks... Uh, are they in the node 3 or 103 or it's... I mean, this is, just, this is just for illustration, right? This is not... Yeah. So it's in actually stone. This information actually stone in the speed. Uh, the, the, split, the split record is going to say that if you want key range... Uh, you want key range uh, five to you know, six, it's five to seven uh, exclusive, then you would go here. So that's essentially equivalent to the X's. But I'm just showing X's to say that these are not, it's still there, the data's still there, but no one will see them. Matt, yes? Uh, so at this point, uh, if you wanted to uh, install an update on page 105, wouldn't you have to do two compare and swaps to get, to get that to work? Right, so the statement is, if I want to do an update to page 105, yeah. let's say I want to insert key 5.5. Yeah. You'd, you'd have to update the split record to point to the, the new update, and you'd have to update the mapping table. Uh, so you would update, hold up, so, so I, I'm, I'm inserting key 105. So there'll be a delta record above the split that says, oh, you put that there. yeah, right? Okay. Is that true? Actually, hold up. No, because if you put it here, um, that new copy of the split note has a pointer to it, you don't have record, and then point to that. So your statement is what? Is you create a new copy of the split record. And then that split note has like the red pointer point to the new delta record, and then to the long five note. And then you just compare a swap. 
that's you have. Well, hold on. So why why can't you why can't you you put the delta record here, right? Then this you update this pointer to now point to the new delta record. Uh, if you then traverse the split, you're following a logical pointer. So you would do a lookup on page 105, and you would see the delta record, and you're fine. Yeah. That's the beauty of this, it, right? It's like, like it's, it's, it solves all of these problems. It's a good question, though. Okay. Yes? If you have multiple threads trying to split, is it possible that one of them has the split record installed and someone else, the other thread tries to install the separation? So, all, all right, so her statement is, if I have two threads, I want to do the split at exactly the same time. Uh, is it possible for one of them to do the split? And the other installs the separator. No, you have to do the split before you do the separator. Yeah, but uh, how do you ensure that all these operations happen atomically because they're different CAS operations? It doesn't matter, right? So, so say I have two threads. They both try to do the split. One of them is going to, going to succeed. The other one fails. Right, so my split's installed. The other one, the other one gets aborted. Now, in the case of the separator, uh, you could do this. You don't, okay, you don't have to do the separator, right? It's just, it's just providing you a shortcut to get to the bottom. Uh, so what you, you know, what you could do is, and I don't know, I forget how exactly we do this. You could have the thread that, in, that was successfully installed the split, then come back and do another traversal because you can't go back up. Come back and do the traversal and say, well, I know that I did a split before, so let me try to install my separator. Right? Or you could say, well, you could have a thread come along and say, I, I see I, there's a split here, but I didn't see a separator. Let me add a separator. And it doesn't matter. But you always have to do the split first before you do the separator, because otherwise the separator is pointing to nothing. Or it's, or it's pointing to something that, that you cannot see if you come down normally. All right, cool. All right. So, uh, let's look at some performance numbers. So, uh, this is from the, the paper you guys read. Uh, so, this is uh, the BW tree running on an older machine with, I think, one socket and four cores, so eight with hyperthreading. Uh, so, they had three workloads. One is derived from an Xbox uh, online game. One's a synthetic microbenchmark, and another one's doing deduplication. Uh, I think in the paper, they only show the numbers for the, the, the BW tree versus the B plus tree. For some of these, so I actually emailed Justin, and we have all the. This is the the full numbers that I think that is not fully reported in the paper, but here's here's the experiments that they did. So across the board, you see that uh, the BW tree is outperforming the the, the concurrent skip list and the B plus tree. So the, this version of the B plus tree is actually from Berkeley DB. So Berkeley DB was like one of the first embedded databases uh, from the from 1990s that came out of UC Berkeley, um, and then Oracle bought them in 2006. Uh, so it's originally a disk-based database system and a disk-based index, but I think for this case here, they turned off all the, the, the disk stuff as well. Um, I'll say also too that the, the Berkeley DB guys, after, it got, after Berkeley DB got bought from, uh, by Oracle, they went and formed another company called Wire Tiger, uh, which then got bought by MongoDB about two years ago and is now the, sort of the, the, uh, the, um, the, the, the default engine you get or storage engine you get from MongoDB. And Wire Tiger is, is awesome. Wire Tiger is really good. Um, so again, across the board, you see that the, the BW tree is outperforming all the other indexes, um, and, this, uh, and especially the skip list, right? Even though it's supposed to be latch-free. In the case, the case here, B, the B plus tree is doing latch crabbing that we talked about last time. All right, so any questions? OK, cool. So in the remaining time now, uh, I want to talk about the adaptive radix tree, or the art index, from Hyper. So as I said at the beginning, uh, the art index is not latch-free. Uh, so the BW tree was, and the skip list is, but this guy is not. Um, and it's worth talking about because it, ha it has some interesting characteristics that are, are different than what you normally would see in an index. So as a real quick show of hands, who here knows what a try is? The try data structure. Okay, small number. Okay, so a radex tree is a, uh, is a, a variant of a try. And I'll show what a try looks like in the next slide. Um, but the key difference we're going to have in a, in a radix tree versus the BW tree and the B plus tree and the skip list is that we're going to store our keys in this digital representation uh, that allows us to examine the prefixes of those keys rather than having to look at, look at the entire key. And when I say digital, I don't mean like an Arabic numeral or a number. I mean like taking the individual elements of the key and storing them one by one. 
So say you're, if your key was a varchar or a string, a digit would be sort of one character in the entire string. So what's interesting about the radex tree is that uh, unlike in a B plus tree, where the height of the tree depends on the number of keys that you have, in a radex tree, it depends on the length, the longest length of, of a key. So if I say if I have in a B plus tree, I have a million, million, um, a million keys, uh, the height of the tree would be log n. In a radex tree, it's the, it's, the, it's the length of the longest key. So if I have one key that's a million, uh, has a million digits, that's completely unique, then the height of my tree will be a million. In practice, that doesn't happen, and we'll, and we'll see why in a second. Again, another nice thing about the radex tree is that it doesn't require any rebalancing, uh, and this is because the, the, the structure of the index, the, structure of the, uh, the, uh, the, the organization of the data structure is deterministic. What I mean by that is, no matter what order you insert the keys that you have, the, the layout of the data structure is always going to be the same. So again, contrast this with the, with the, with the B bus tree or, or, or skip list. If I insert the keys in either sorted order or random order, the, the layout of the, of the tree is going to be different each time. In a, skip li or sorry, in, a, in a radix tree, it's always exactly the same. And we'll see, we'll see why in a second. The other cool thing about it is that the, since we're not storing the actual entire key over and over again inside of the index, we're actually going to store, uh, again, the digits along the path in the tree, so we can actually reconstruct the keys to put them back into its original form by traversing the index. Okay? So this is what a try looks like. Right? So say the keys I have are hello, hat, and have. So what you're going to do is you're going to break up the digits, or the, in this case the characters of the string, and store them down in the data structure. And you're, what you're going to do is, for cases where you have overlapping characters that, that, are, that, that are the same for each key, you only have to store it once. So in this case here, all three keys have, start with the letter H, so I just have the H at, 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 you know, at, at the top. And that's enough to represent all three keys. And then, so in the case, in the case of the key hello, I'll have a path down long in the tree for H-E-L-L-O, and at the bottom I'm going to have a pointer to the actual tuple. So again, I'm not storing... Yes, I'm storing the key hello in my index, but it's not sort of all concatenated together as it would be in a B plus tree or a skip list. And then what we'll have to is like, we'll have a you know, special uh, a bit to say whether the pointer we're looking at is another node in the, in the try or it's a point, pointer to a 64-bit pointer to a tuple. So this is like the try. This is a, the, sort of the standard version of this. So now, in a, all right, so the same thing here, sorry. Hat and have, they both have A as the second character, so you only have to store it once, and then it, then it splits below that. So in a radex tree, the big difference is that we actually can do compression uh, for when we know we have a unique suffix. So in this case here, for the key hello, we don't store E-L-L-O as we did here. We only have to store E-L-L-O together as, as a single suffix with just one pointer. So we don't have that chain that we have going down before. But then we have the same layout on the side here for hat and have. And again, VE for the suffix of have is not shared by hat. So therefore, those two digits are stored together. So a radix tree is basically a compressed version of, of, of a try. So now what makes the art index be adaptive is, is how they're going to support modifications. So you don't actually store a... Uh, an art index in the same way that I showed here where you have sort of like these nodes and then you have these, these, these edges where that's where you store the actual the key, the key digits. Instead you'll have these sort of nodes that span uh, a level and you'll pack in multiple digits with, within that level. So this is the same keys I had before, hat, have, and hat. Uh, and so at level one we just have the H because so that's shared by multiple keys. But at the second level we have a separate portion of the node for ELLO and then we have A point down to the third level for, for V, E, and T. So now let's say I want to insert the key here. I would traverse down H, H, A, get to this node here, and recognize that this is where I want to put the IR, and I store the, and I, I store the pointer there. Again, this is different than what we saw possibly in, in like a VW tree or a B, a B plus G index, where you may have sort of separate leaf nodes storing all this at the lowest level. This is sort of, you try to pack every much, every, as much as possible you can uh, in a single node down at the bottom. Let's say I want to delete had and have. 
Well, again, you do traverse down, you find these, these keys, you go ahead and blow them away, and then you can recognize that this thing is, is nearly empty, so you can go ahead and consolidate them. And so the paper talks about how to sort of do this in, a, in, in an efficient manner. Um, that's, that's memory aligned or word aligned, so that you reduce the number of cache misses you have as you traverse this. So, as I said, the, the, um, so, so what, we'll get to how, how it's not latch in a second, but one of the cool things also too about the, the art index that I like is that they deal with uh, how to store key types that are not amenable to doing the sort of digit decomposition and do binary comparison. So what they have is they have sort of a recipe book of how to take all the possible different scalar types you can have in your database and how to store them in, in a manner that can be easily stored in a, in a, in a radex tree or, or art index and do efficient comparison of them. So in the case of like unsigned integers, uh, normally on x86 they're stored in a little endian uh, layout, but that's not, you can't do mem, mem compare on the individual digits because it would be going in reverse order, which is not what you want. Same thing for like sign integers, if you just stored like the, the bits uh, or bytes within the, um, within the, within the, the index, you know, the, the upper level bits would be whether it's, you know, negative or not, and that would be, an, you know, not a correct comparison. Floats the same thing, they have to do some, uh, uh, convert them to sort of these fixed formats, uh, integers, and for compound index, compound keys, you just transform each of them separately and, and then you concatenate them. So let me show what I mean by this. I'll show how, what we're talking about for the unsigned integers, because this should be pretty straightforward to understand. So say I have an integer key, this one's like 168 million. Uh, if you want to convert that to hex, you'll see why you have to store this in big endian format in the radix tree instead of little endian. So if you store it in big endian, uh, you would have from, from the highest memory, or lowest memory location to the end, you would have it in the order you would expect it as you read across from zero to A. So now if I want to do a comparison to say is some number less than another number, I can just look at these high order bits and do, do a straight mem compare and see that, yes, it is, is it indeed in one's lesser than the other. But whereas if you do it in a little endian format, if you look at the upper level bits and you do a mem compare, well this is actually incorrect because you're looking at the lower portion of the digits, right? And that's not going to be an, a, valid, a valid comparison. You'd have to convert it back or put this into registers and invoke like a comparison instruction. Whereas if you do mem compare, that's much faster. So now the way we'd store this in our radix tree here for this, if we put everything in a uh, big endian format, for this key here, again, we just store the, the, the bytes as we go down. And now as we do our check on our tree to see whether our entry is there, again, we start with the higher level bit, uh, bits and go down one by one. And that we can do straight mem copy or mem compares on, on, on those. Right? So we have to do a little extra work to transform the indexes to put it into a format that makes it easier for us to store it into the radix tree, the art index, but that's going to make our comparisons go, go much faster. Is this sort of clear what's going on? So this is, I think this is one of the key ideas that the, 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 the hyper guys did in their index. So it's so good also to, we actually do this in our own, in our own system. So remember I talked about how for your skipless implementation, uh, we already provide for you the, uh, how, do you, how to store keys and how to do comparison to keys, right? It's, sort of, it's those template arguments that, that, that you have to specify. And so we have actually uh, two t implementations of t keys and then two implementations for doing comparisons with those keys. So the compact int key is when you have a, uh, one or more integers that we can store in big endian format like in, like in the art index. And that allows you to do fast mem, mem compares to see whether a, one key is less than another or whether equivalent. And then the generic key is like what you would expect to do with the first time you ever wrote an index where you just take the keys and you concatenate their memory locations to be one after another and that's what you store as, as the composite index. And the two type of compare readers we have are the generic compare would be like I, I, I sort of dereference um, each offset in the index into a value object and do a comparison based on that. And then the fast compare is what I wrote uh, or two, or two months ago or so, where I just dereference the pointer directly into a, with a reinterpret cast and do a comparison on the, the memory location that way. Um, so it is just showing you doing, storing the stuff in the big Indian format and doing comparison uh, is much faster than the other two approaches. So for this workload, it's basically taking uh, 10 million keys in a, sing in a single thread, inserting them into the BW tree, uh, seeing how fast that goes. Then we're going to do a lookup on every single key and see how fast that goes, then we're going to go ahead and delete every key. 
So again, what you see is that doing the compact integer representation is much faster than everything else. And then my fast compare rater is uh, faster than sort of the old default slower one. And the big reason why this is faster is because you're instantiating less objects, you're allocating less memory to do a comparison. Right? You try to do everything within directly within comparing two registers. So again, this is just, when you look at the code, you'll see compact ins key, you'll see generic key, you'll see fast generic compare rater and generic compare rater. This is sort of what's going on there. And so this is not something you have to do manually. When you invoke the index factory to make your index for you, it'll know wh what your key types look like and it'll automatically pick which of these, which of these three setups it'll, you'll do. So if you have a var char, it'll have to default to, to like this one in your key. If you have all integers, it can use the compact one. I think floats and everything else, but it will also use the, the middle one as well. Is that clear? Again, this is something you don't have to worry about. If you just want to know what you, what you see in the code when you start using the index, uh, this, this, this is what's going on. Okay. All right, so real quickly, uh, as I said, the art index is not latch free, uh, but they have a paper that came out last year where they talk about how to do a optimistic crabbing scheme where you have writers end up not being blocked on, write, on readers. So they're doing latch crabbing just as you would in a regular B plus tree. Um, but what they'll have is they'll have a, the latch inside the index node will have a counter. So anytime a writer thread wants to acquire an exclusive lock or a write lock for that node, it does a compare and swap because like, it's, it's a spin lock. It, it acquires the lock and if it gets it, then it increments a counter atomically. And then what will happen is the readers come along and they don't, they'll check to see whether the lock's already being held. If, if it is, then they have to wait because you can't have a reader try to read something when a writer's trying to write to it. Uh, but if it's not being held, then they go ahead and allow to, to, you know, sort of virtually acquire the lock. But they also keep track of what was the version number of the counter when they checked it the first time. So then when they come back and want to un unlock the latch, they just check to see whether the counter is still the same as it was before. If, if it is, then it knows that another writer has come along and modified the, 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 the node you're looking at. If it's still the same, then you're fine. So you're sort of optimistically assuming that the, uh, the readers will, will not get interfered with by writers, but then you don't, you know, you don't pay the cost of blocking and waiting to require, um, as you take back, you don't pay the cost of blocking writers when you have threads in there doing reads. And in their case, they're also doing the same epoch-based garbage collection that we, that we talked about before. We have to keep track of what threads are running around inside the system. All right, this is showing you as another alternative uh, to doing the latch free stuff um, in, in art. I forget, what, I think there is a uh, latch free try also from other, other group of Germans that came out, I think, uh, a few years ago. Um, and I, I don't know why they, they didn't do the same thing, but that's fine. All right, so the last set of benchmarks I want to show you are, I was debating whether to actually show you guys this or not because it's, it's sort of incomplete and it's sort of, I don't want to give you the false impression but it'll, it'll highlight some key aspect of, of art about why I'm spending the time to show you this. So this is a single threaded benchmark, it's not doing any multi-threading at all, and uh, it's gonna be doing this on a, a 30 million random 64-bit uh, keys. And so we'll have three types of workload, we'll do read-only, insert-only, and then a read-write mix, I think it's like 50% um, reads, 50% writes, and then a sequential scan along leaf nodes with inserts, so I think like, 10% scans, 90% inserts. So the five, bench, the five indexes we're going to compare against are the B plus tree, uh, which is, is, is the SDX B plus tree is sort of a, a good open source, state of the art implementation of a single threaded B plus tree. As far as I know, we have a trouble finding a good you know, uh, concurrent B plus tree. But this one's single threaded, so that's why we're doing a single threaded experiment. Then we have the mash tree, which is the, uh, the index used in the silo system. Um, Mastery is essentially a tree of tries or a tri of trees. It's sort of a hybrid combination of, a tr of B plus trees and tries. Then we have the skip list, a concurrent skip list. Then we have the BW tree uh, that we implemented. And then we have the, the art index from the, uh, the Germans, the hyper guys. So the two things I just want to point out real quickly is that like, you see the high, way higher number you get in the, in the art index over everything else. Like, this is single threaded, so we're not measuring contention here. This is like best case scenario for all these indexes. Uh, and, that's, and this is about 4x faster than everyone else. Right? And this is based on because uh, you, know, you have 
the, the the index is more compact. You have uh, you 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 can quickly find the thing that you're looking for, uh, and you don't have to do expensive comparisons for keys all over and over again. And then again, it's, it's faster with all these cases here, even for the scan and insert. And then the other thing I'll point out too is like uh, I got these numbers. So the, with all the numbers except for the BW tree is from a paper we had published last year. The BW tree was, was uh, these experiments were run by a student that took 721 last year and he implemented the, the BW tree that's in the system now. I don't think he's running on the same hardware. Uh, I have to double check this. I, he sent me the numbers like late last night, so I'm not sure. So that's why I think we're running a little bit slower. I don't think it's, in, it's an exact apples to apples comparison, but it's, it's close enough and they're, they're, they're definitely running the same workload. But just showing you here that we're, the, the BW tree is going to be slightly slower than every, everyone else. And again, that's because you have that mapping table, because you have to um, do that lookup all the time to figure out, you know, from a logical pointer to a physical pointer to figure out where's the data that you're looking for. But, you know, maybe, if, maybe next week I can show, like, concurrent numbers with, you know, a multi-thread experiment. In that case, when you see in the paper that you guys read, the, the BW tree definitely does perform better than these other guys. We haven't measured it yet against the, the, the art index to see how much faster they are. All right, so any questions about this? Again, this is sort of, you know, for your own edification about why I'm spending time to find art, even though it's not latch free, because the performance numbers are hard to ignore. Okay? All right, so my parting thoughts. I think the BW tree is one of the more interesting latch free index data structures that have come out in recent years. Uh, and this is actually a really hot area in research, right? There's papers coming out all the time for better skip lists, uh, better latch free indexes, and things like that. So uh, at this point, the BW tree is four or five years old. Um, and we have done some work to improve it over what the Microsoft, original Microsoft paper was done, uh, had, had talked about. Um, but like I said, it'd be interesting to see how this compares against art or maybe the, the, some of the, the better skip lists that, that have come out in the last year from the guys in Australia. But in my opinion, I, like, to me, when I read the BW tree, like, it really just sort of clicked in my mind, that, oh, the mapping table is this the key thing that allows you to to avoid all these other issues that you can have in, in a skip list and other uh, lock free, latch free data structures. Right? So it's a single location where you, where you can update pointers. All right, so uh, to finish up in the last 10 minutes or so, I want to talk about some tips for doing profiling in, 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 the, in the database system. So now these are generic tips, right? These are applicable to when you go out in the real world and whatever application you're working on. Uh, but I'll just sort of, I'll show the examples of how to do this in the context of, of Peloton. And, uh, and, and your project. Right, so say we have some kind of program uh, that has two functions, foo and bar. So, you know, naive question is how can we check the speed of, of, of our program and figure out how to, how to make it actually run faster? So the naive way to do this is just you open up GDB or whatever your favorite debugger is and every so often you're just going to randomly hit pause and look at the stack trace and see what function the, 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 the program is in. Right? It's the dumbest thing you can do, but you can do it. And so let's say that we did this, and we collected 10 call stack samples, and we saw that six out of the 10 times we were in our function foo. So from this, we know that, you know, based on this estimate of the samples that we have, that 60% of the time is spent in foo. And obviously we can improve this by, you know, maybe getting that little, uh, the servo hand that you've seen on YouTube to hit the button to pause over and over again, right, in your laptop. Uh, so we increase the number of samples we have and we, and we get a better number of this. But we'll see how we don't have to do this uh, coming up. So before we talk about that, we, we, we can talk a little about Amdahl's law to understand what kind of speed up we can expect if we try to go optimize this foo function. Right? So we know foo was running 6% of the time and say that there's something really stupid in our code where we go ahead and fix it and now we can run two times faster. So what's the expected overall speed up of this? Right? Well. Again, 60% 6 of the time we spent in the program in the function foo, but that'll get dropped in half. But then the 40% of the time in the other part of the program that was executing the function bar, that stays uh, unaffected, right? That's not changed. So Amdo's law is this nice little function here that says, based on the percentage of the time we spent in the task we optimized and what, what the speed up we can get from that optimization, it'll tell us what should be the expected theoretical improvement of, of our change. So in this case here, for 60% of the program of cutting that speed in half, we'd expect the speed up to be 1.4. So this is something to be mindful of when you start debugging and profiling your, your, your skip list, right? You'll see what functions you're spending all your time on, uh, 
And just because you maybe run, make them run you know, 3x, 2x, 4x faster, you're not going to see that sort of a cumulative uh, change throughout the entire system, right? It's going to be a subset of the overall runtime of the system. Okay? Alright, so, again, since we don't want to have a little robot hit our laptop over and over again, we have two tools we actually can use to do profiling. So, uh, quick show of hands, who here has used Valgrind other than for Project 2 or Project 1? Not many, okay. Who here has used Perf? One, okay, so. Um, so these are the two main tools that, that people use, at least in the Linux world. I'm sure there's equivalent things in, in a sort of Windows environment. But in Valgrind, what, what's going to be is it's essentially like a virtual machine uh, where it's going to run your program with a bunch of instrumentation to record everything that it's possibly doing. Um, and then the nice thing about it is it's going to have nice visualization tools to show you where you're spending all your time. In Perf, it's m m much more lightweight. And the way it works is it enables uh, these sort of hardware performance counters that, that, that Linux provides you, the kernel provides, and keeps track of them for running your application. Right? And then they'll have a, uh, I'll show what it looks like, they'll have like a console-oriented tool to, uh, sort of to show you where you're spending all your time. In general, in my opinion, I prefer running in, uh, in Valgrind or, or Callgrind. Um, Perf is sometimes good to get sort of a quick, quick numbers. All right, so, Valgrind is sort of a suite of, uh, of, of, of debugging tools for, for uh, Linux programs um, or Unix programs. And we've seen memcheck before because when you're on Valgrind for the, uh, the extract test for project number one, right, that would show you when, whether you had memory leaks or invalid uh, memory lookups and things like that. The other program you can use is Callgrind. And that's going to be generate you the, the call graph of where, you know, what function calls what function and how much time you're spending in, in these different parts. So to use call grind, you basically invoke val grind, but you, then you pass in the command on what tool you want, and then whatever, it, whatever uh, executable, executable you want to invoke. So in this case here, you would call val grind, and pass in the tool command, and then you can say, I want to invoke my skip list index test. You can also run this on the, the, in the, full, the full binary of, of the database system. Um, and it gets a complete stack trace of, of the entire, entire program. Uh, for this, I, th I don't think you have to run this in, in, as root. For perf, you do, because you have to get performance counters from the, from the kernel. But Valgrind, I think, can run in uh, user, user space. So what's going to happen now is uh, the, when your, your program finishes, it's going to spit out this file with, with callgrind.out dot whatever process ID your program ran as. And then you can use uh, the visualization tool called Cache Grind, and it'll generate you a nice uh, uh, chart that lo looks like this. Right? You'll have like a cumulative distribution time for, all, for your program, and then I'll make this nice call graph to show you uh, where you're spending all, you know, what calls what and how much time they're spending in it. Um, so I can show you sort of the live version of it. So this is a trace I collected last month. That, that's less readable, right? All right. Uh, well, anyway, so, you, so you'll see here, you can get, here's all the function calls in order, like this calls this calls this, and then you have this nice call graph that shows uh, how many times this function was invoked, and then the percentage of the time that was spent in the, uh, in the different parts, right? So this function execute plan was uh, invoked 140,000 times, and this is where we spent 66% of our time in the system, right? And then it shows you what, 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 they, what, what it invoked. Um, and then you can double click this, right? Uh, and it, it'll, it'll sort of, like if I double click one of these other ones, it'll rebuild the call graph and show, you know, what was happening inside of that. Because what'll happen is it'll, sh for the high level stuff, it'll show just the heavy hitters. And then you have to zoom in to kind of see more information about, you know, what's going inside this function. And then what I really nice is, what I like it is up here at the top, so maybe I'll try this one here. It'll give you actually, um, if you have the source code installed and you run with debugging symbols, you can see like here's the actual lines of code that were, that were invoked, how many times they, they were invoked, and how much time, the cumulative time they were spent in, in, in each of them. Right? So this is like more than just saying you know, what function was called and how often. And you can go line by line and see where you're spending all your time. This is part of the reason why I like call grind better. Um, I'll say also too, for this, you want to make sure that you, you, you compile your program uh, with the release mode, not debug mode. Because what will happen is there will be all these log, deb log debug statements, and those are creating strings and writing to standard out, so that's where you're going to see all your time being spent, not the real system. 
not, not, not the code that you wrote. So you want to make sure you compile with, with, with um, in release mode. It actually is trickier than that because if you compile in release mode, you lose the symbols. Yeah. All right. So I'll, I'll write instructions how to do this, how to, how to do it correctly. Um, yeah, yeah, I forgot about that. Sorry. So, uh, right. So that's, that's call run. The other one is, is perf, and it said the way this works is that it uses performance counters that Linux provides for how much times it's it got. Uh, actually, it's 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 doing hardware counters. So like so, you measure things like how many cycles you're spending or instructions you're you're spending, how many cache misses you have, and also the low-level hardware things that are, are difficult to measure or you can't measure with call grind. So the way this works is you sort of say perf record, and you specify like what you want to count, how often you should take samples. Um, and then what program you want to invoke. And then once you get the, once, when your process finishes, it'll dump out a, I think it's called like, there'll be a file called perf.report or something. Um, and so you just invoke the perf, perf command again, but with this, this, this report option, and that'll give you sort of like a, again, sort of the same thing with a, uh, an ordered list of where you're spending all your time here, right? And I'll show you what it looks like in the live version. Right, so you can actually like you know go down and see, you know wh where you're spending all your time, right? So like in this case here, this is the this is the BW tree index test, um, and it looks like we're spending all our time allocating strings for something. I forget what the test was, right? There's more strings, more strings. Uh, this is a SIMD mem copy, malloc and free malloc, and then here's actually some code that we that we wrote, right? Doing some some comparison, right? So perf is okay because uh, you can get at a high level you know what's going on and it'll show you things like um, how do I say this it'll show you sort of more fine grain things than what perf can show I said what, what call grain can show but I in my opinion I like call grain better okay right so community distribution and then everything and then there's a bunch of different other events that you can measure like cache misses and, and branch mis mispredictions that may be relevant for whatever, you know, what you're doing in Project 2 or possibly later on for Project 3. Okay? So, uh, the, well, we'll post the slides on, um, on, on the course website so you'll be able to get all these links. So there's a bunch of tutorials, a bunch of walkthroughs about how to do this. There is a Wikipedia article on how to do run, run perf and call grind for the full Peloton system. But I think the instructions that I'm showing you here should be enough to run for the, the skipless index test. And then I'll write up instructions on how to compile the code with debugging systems turned on, but with log messages turned off, uh, which is not tr trivial, but I'll, I'll, try, I'll try to make it easy for you guys. Okay? So any questions about profiling? Okay. Uh, so next class, we're gonna be the last lecture on indexing. Uh, we're going to do look at more, another work, another paper from Microsoft Research. And again, I think Microsoft Research is probably the best uh, database research group outside of academia. Uh, and they, so they do a lot of great stuff. So we're, we're going to look at a paper of how you actually build indexes for uh, OLAP database systems. And so this will be looking at the, uh, the special engine for, for a SQL Server called Apollo. So just in the same way that Hecaton was the O2P engine